In January 1923, I picked up the threads of my naval career, a career which took me to diverse and interesting places, here to Greenwich and to Portsmouth, and above all to Malta and all over the Mediterranean. Now I had to get down to hard work again because I was determined to make a success of my profession, as my father had done. I was very ambitious. Why should I deny it? It just meant that I intended to do well, to do well in the Navy in the aftermath of a great war. Not the easiest of circumstances, but I always enjoyed hard work. And now it began in a historic setting, in Constantinople and the Dardanelles. Constantinople, 1923, an occupied city, a trouble center. When the Turkish Empire collapsed in 1918, vultures descended on its carcass. The victorious allies, Britain, France and Italy, seized their shares. The Arabs carved out independent kingdoms. The Jews demanded a national home. The Greeks perceived an opportunity to revive their ancient glories. In May 1919, Greek forces landed in Asia Minor to begin a new war which dragged on for over two years. For Turkey now found a leader, Mustafa Kemal. Kemal rejected the Allied peace terms of the Treaty of Seb. He overthrew the Sultan's government which had signed the treaty. He revived the Turkish nation Winston Churchill found the words for this phenomenon. Loaded with follies, stained with crimes, rotted with misgovernment, shattered by battle, worn down by long disastrous wars, his empire falling to pieces around him, the Turk was still alive. In August 1922, Mustafa Kemal's ragged army won a decisive victory over the Greeks. In September, the Turks entered Smyrna, the great port on the Aegean Sea, which had been for centuries the stronghold of Greek civilization in Asia Minor. Now Smyrna became a scene of tragedy, a place of lamentation. In the fire and massacre that followed Turkish occupation, it was reported that 120,000 people lost their lives. The Greek presence in Asia Minor, dating from the great days of Athens, was swept away. Once more, an international crisis produced a family tragedy for us, this time in the Eastern Mediterranean. Prince Andrew of Greece, brother of King Constantine I, was my brother-in-law. He had married my elder sister, Alice. Already Alice, and Andrea, as he was known in the family, had been in exile once for the king. But in 1920, there was a plebiscite which replaced King Constantine on the throne, and they returned with him to Greece. Prince Andrew was a professional soldier, so he now went back to the Greek army and rose to the rank of Lieutenant General commanding an army corps in Asia Minor. But he always had serious doubts about the way in which the war with Turkey was conducted. He was well aware of the army's weakness, the inefficiency and corruption of some of its officers, and he opposed the absurdly optimistic ideas of the high command. Early in 1922, when all his protests had failed, he applied for a command outside the war zone. But this didn't save him when disaster hit the Greek army later that year. King Constantine had to abdicate again. And my brother-in-law, Prince Andrew, was put on trial for his life in Athens. He was saved by British intervention at the direct instigation of King George V. And he and my sister went into second exile on board a British cruiser. They called at their home in Corfu to pick up their children, my four nieces and my 18-month-old nephew, Prince Philip. This was just a month before I joined my next ship, the Revenge at Constantinople, in the midst of a further crisis, which very nearly dragged us into war, Chanak. The collapse of Greece 
placed the Allied forces of occupation in a dangerous position. Mountbatten found himself at the center of the storm. Trenches and fortified lines were hastily constructed outside Constantinople, where the Allies faced the victorious Turks. But Allied policy was divided. When Mustafa Kemal's men arrived at Tranak on the Dardanelles Straits, France and Italy withdrew their forces. The British were left to handle the crisis alone. At Trenac, there was only one infantry battalion and a cavalry squadron, backed by the Royal Navy. The Mediterranean fleet assembled in strength. It was the only strength available. The Turks crowded up to the British outposts, and for months it was touch and go whether war might not explode out of some incident on the picket lines. But the British Commander-in-Chief, General Sir Charles Harrington, and his officers kept their heads. The troops and sailors displayed their best phlegmatic qualities. Tempers cooled, and peace was signed at last with the new Turkish Republic. In October 1923, the occupation forces left Turkey. The Mediterranean fleet with HMS Revenge and Lieutenant Mountbatten returned to its peace station. To Nack wasn't the only crisis the Navy had to face in the early 20s. At home, there was the inevitable outcry against large naval estimates in peacetime. This had already led to a pretty drastic cutting down of ships and men. Worse still, it prevented new building, and many of our ships were becoming seriously obsolete. Also, the days of our complete naval supremacy had passed. In 1921, by the Washington Naval Treaty, we accepted parity with the United States. Indeed, we were glad to get that. But the price of it was the ending of the Anglo-Japanese alliance, which meant that Japan now became a possible enemy. And Japan was already a leading naval power in her own right. I'd seen some of her navy myself during my tour with the Prince of Wales in 1922. And I'd been lucky enough to go on board its latest ship, the Mutsu, the most powerful battleship in the world. I was the only foreign officer to be allowed to make a real inspection of her. Perhaps they thought I was too young and silly to matter. But in fact, I compiled a most secret report, particularly on her armor. I recorded in my diary my apprehension of Japan's growing strength. So this was a difficult period of adjustment for the Royal Navy. Adjustment to economic realities, and to political realities. In my humble capacity as a junior lieutenant, I also found myself faced with difficulties. One of them, I later discovered, cropped up even as I rejoined the Revenge. The captain didn't want me. Well, I, I had a list uh, of the officers and I looked at them and I saw their names too, Mountbatten and another one. And I happened to be rather old-fashioned and uh, rather conservative in my views. Namely, I think all on board a ship should look to the captain for praise or blame. And in those two, especially Mountbatten, I imagined I saw somebody who wouldn't care a tuppenny cuss what I did think of him. So very naturally, I asked the Admiral if they'd kindly have them two removed before I joined. Well, as you, <laughs> as you know, they did not grant my very reasonable request. And, of course, nobody was more grateful than I was that they hadn't. So Mountbatten's career was not cut short. He remained in the revenge to pursue his profession in the Navy of the Twenties. It was a Navy with much to learn. It now had a new competitor, the young Royal Air Force, itself sadly under strength and lacking the new machines which the swift progress of aviation made constantly necessary. The meaning of air power was passionately debated. It was demonstrated that aircraft with bombs could sink any type of ship. Some airmen claimed that this made battleships, or any large warships, obsolete. Others insisted that the aircraft carrier must become the war winner of the future. The Navy had to adapt itself to these developments. It had to evolve new techniques of its own. In a highly competitive and increasingly scientific period, professionalism acquired new meanings.
The Mediterranean fleet, in which Mountbatten was serving, was based on Malta. Since the days of Nelson, this island had been the center of British naval might in the Mediterranean. And in the 20s, that might was still considerable. But Mountbatten himself was now faced with an important decision. What should I specialize in? My first thought was submarines, because I'd had some experience in them in the war, but I decided against it. I thought that in peacetime they wouldn't be so exciting, and they were terribly uncomfortable. I thought of aviation, but the Navy had lost control of the fleet air arm, and in order to fly in my own service, I'd have had to get a commission in another service, and that didn't appeal to me. So after a lot of thought, I decided on signals. In any case, I'd always been deeply interested in communications and in what we now call electronics. Mountbatten now became what the Navy calls a communicator. At the end of 1924, he went to the signal school at Portsmouth to learn his new trade. And in 1925, he attended the higher wireless course at Greenwich. But to Mountbatten, communications always meant more than signals. As a very junior officer in HMS Revenge, he had filmed a ship's newsreel with his own camera. Trick photography was a mysterious novelty in those days, and Mountbatten used it with relish, for his own amusement and everyone else's. I'd always been extremely interested in films. I still am. I shared this interest with my brother. In 1916, in the Lion, he brought his own cinema projector with him and trained me as assistant operator. We showed all sorts of films. Charlie Chaplin comedies, epics like Birth of a Nation, whatever we could get hold of. It was easy to see how important this was for the fleet in war, but it soon proved to be just as important in peace, especially on stations where the sailors were more or less cut off from civilization for months on end. My files show that as early as 1923, in the Revenge, I was trying to get a proper organization set up for showing films to the fleet, the birth of the idea of the Royal Naval Film Corporation. But, like all progressive innovations, it was hard going. I had a projection room constructed next to the reading room in the Revenge. But when I submitted a suggestion that other ships should copy this idea, I, I got a rocket from the Admiralty for interfering with the construction of one of HM ships without getting their Lordship's prior approval. Even earlier than this, I had concluded that films could be a wonderful medium for instruction. So when I was flag of in the Renown in 1920, I made an instructional film to illustrate fleet maneuvers. I was the director, and I did my own animation. You see the flag of tent? That's me, running to the edge of the Admiral's Bridge to shout down the appropriate signal to the flag deck. The signal, bend on and hoist the flags, compass, four, numeral. There goes the answering pennant. Now the signal is hauled down, that is the executive order. And this is the maneuver, a 45 degree wheel to starboard. Here's the flag attendant again. This signal is nuts orange, N-O. Answering pennant. Executive order. Now the maneuver, what we call the gridiron. Very spectacular at high speed and liable to give a nervous captain heart failure. But very good for encouraging smartness and precision and morale. But their lordships of the Admiralty were not impressed. They said they could see no possible use for instructional films in the Royal Navy. The mid-twenties approached, and it seemed that the bitter aftermath of the Great War would never disperse. In January 1923, the French army marched into the Ruhr to exact reparations from Germany. The French forfeited British and American sympathy and stirred dangerous forces of German nationalism. Imitating the march of Mussolini's black shirts on Rome, in November 1923, the new National Socialist Workers' Party, the Nazis, headed by Adolf Hitler, attempted to putsch in Munich. It failed miserably, 
But in the face of extremist violence, the more moderate elements in Germany and France gained strength. In 1925, it seemed that a true peace might be at hand. The Treaty of Locarno was signed between Britain, France, Germany and Italy. Winston Churchill wrote, by the waters of a calm lake, the four great Western democracies plighted their solemn troth to keep the peace among themselves in all circumstances. But a war-damaged world had yet to glimpse prosperity. Inflation in Germany, unemployment in Germany, Britain and America produced a new poverty, a new breeding ground of hate. Britain's first Labour government, under Ramsay MacDonald, had come and gone in 1924, leaving the problem of unemployment untouched. In 1926 came the general strike, the event long heralded by the left, long dreaded by moderate men. Once more, as troops moved in to maintain services and keep order, British industrial towns had a look of war. The strike failed but left its own aftermath of anger and frustration. Yet the 20s won the title, Gay. Amid all their troubles, people obeyed the unconquerable urge to enjoy themselves. Film stars were the new popular idols. The Hollywood and Broadway musicals came into their own. Cole Porter, a friend of Edwina Mountbatten, even wrote Lord Louis into one of his show numbers. But she knows cause she has traveled miles, she can always lay them in the aisles and she's wearing silk and satin. She can fly. Edwina Mountbatten herself, a recognized leader of the smart set, was always news. Edwina was a year and a half younger than me. She was a society beauty, one of the best dressed women in the world, a great heiress, and so definitely one of the leaders of the smart set. I say smart set. In fact, there were several. First, there was the Prince of Wales's set, with which we were obviously connected because he and I were such close friends. The Duke of Kent, his youngest brother, was also a close friend. He belonged to our set, what the newspapers call the Mountbatten set. And so our social life was often in the news, and many people formed the impression, from what they read in newspapers and society magazines, that I was just a playboy. But I wasn't really all that good at the smart life. I hope I wasn't actually a bore, but I was often accused of spending most of my time at a dinner party on the evening out talking to a man about something that interested me, most probably something to do with the Navy, instead of paying proper attention to the pretty girls. And some of them used to get rather irritated by this. But I couldn't change my nature. The newspapers and many of our friends never saw that other side of me. They didn't see all the hard work. And anyhow, hard work isn't news. But that was what my life mainly consisted of and it kept me commuting between England and the Mediterranean, taking courses either here at the Royal Naval College Greenwich or at Portsmouth. I'm not saying I didn't have fun. I possessed a 40 knot motorboat, which got me into bad odor with the Royal Yacht Squadron of Cows. In fact, I was blackballed in 1925 and again in 1926, when my name was proposed for membership. This was the age of speed. We were all rather speed crazy. It was during this period that Britain proudly achieved all the speed records on land, on water, and in the air. I was friends with Sir Henry Seagrave, who held both land and water records. I knew R.J. Mitchell, the aircraft designer 
who at that time was building seaplanes as a private venture to win the Schneider Trophy. I remember taking him out in my boat to watch his machine compete in one of the races. Later, of course, he developed these seaplanes into the famous Spitfire fighters of World War II. I enjoyed fast boats and fast cars. Once in 1924, I drove down from Brook House in Park Lane, that was our London home, to the gates of Portsmouth Barracks in one hour, 32 minutes. And that was the days before motorways and before four-wheel brakes. But work was always the main thing. In 1925, I took the higher wireless course here at Greenwich. And in 1927, I was appointed Assistant Fleet Wireless Officer of the Mediterranean Fleet. Sir Mountbatten found himself back at Malta in HMS Queen Elizabeth, in which he had served in the Grand Fleet under Admiral Beatty in 1917. Now the flagship of Admiral Sir Roger Keyes, Commander-in-Chief Mediterranean. Mountbatten was now on the Admiral's staff as Assistant Fleet Wireless Officer. This was the number one appointment for a newly fledged signal officer, but I'd earned it by coming out top in the signals course. Only after Sir Admiral Keyes confessed to me that when he saw my name on the list, he struck it out. But why, I said, you didn't even know me. That's why I struck it out, he said. I didn't want a cousin of the king out here on my staff. Then why am I here, I asked. I'll tell you, he replied. I'd already written to the Admiralty saying I didn't want you, but I was thinking about it. And I looked at an old file of letters from your father. And I realized he'd given me such support as a young man and shown so much confidence in me I felt I couldn't do this to his son. So I sent a telegram to the Admiralty, cancelling my letter. That's why you're here. And then he added, I felt it only fair to you to admit this. This sort of thing happened to me more than once in my life. It made me more than ever determined to justify myself to myself by being really proficient in every aspect of my work. In all spheres of his life, Mountbatten cultivated proficiency. During this period, he extended his pursuit of it beyond work into sport, the sport of polo, in which he would in due course reach an eminence almost equaling his later eminence as a sailor, a most unusual achievement for a serving officer. The newsreels of the 30s recalled some of Mountbatten's successes at polo in Malta. What a marvellous game polo is. It combines so many things. Riding, of course, but with more than the usual skill because of positioning the pony. And then there's the thrill of hitting the ball at full speed, and you can hit a very long ball at polo. But the greatest satisfaction is to play with a really close-knit team. Next to ice hockey, polo is probably the fastest game in the world. And there's always a spice of danger. I can hardly think of a season when I didn't have some collision resulting in a broken collarbone, a dislocated shoulder, a sprained ankle and so forth, but it made it all the more exciting. Get out of the way! Get out of the bloody way! Oh, get up! Not that I was naturally good at it, mind you. I wasn't a particularly good rider, and I hadn't got a good eye for ball games. So I had to plug away at it to become respectably good, and I made a point of really studying the game. I got slow motion films made of English and American internationals to analyze the shots. I also analyzed the polo stick, and I devised a very popular one to give increased length and loft to the shot. I practiced hitting for hours on end for accuracy and length. I worked out tactics with my team on a billiard table. I had to do all this myself because polo is an amateur game and there are no professionals to teach you. When I asked the famous international for advice on hitting, all he could say to me was, my dear Dicky, strike quickly, strike like a snake. Well, that's not much help, is it? So for the benefit of people like myself, I wrote down all the lessons I'd learned in very simple language. I called the book Introduction to Polo and I signed it Marco. To my astonishment, it became a bestseller. It's now in its seventh or eighth edition, and it's been translated into several languages. Polo was a big thing in my life in Malta, particularly capturing the Navy team, the Blue Jackets, right through to the finals at Hurlingham, 
of the Army's interregimental tournament against all their crack teams. So the Malta Polo Club here on the Marza plays a big part in my memories of Malta. This street is also very much mixed up with my memories of Malta. We used to live in this house called Casa Medina, which we shared with my brother. But we got used to following the fleet round by now, and the Mediterranean wasn't a bad place to follow it round in. Not quite the playground it is nowadays, but still quite exciting, as the Navy did its round of cruises and showing the flag. By now, we had a family. My eldest daughter, Patricia, was born in 1924 and first came to Malta when she was three. My second daughter, Pamela, was born in 1929 in rather extraordinary circumstances. My ship was at Barcelona. Edwina drove herself to meet me there over very bumpy roads, which were probably the cause of our troubles. You see, she was one of those remarkable women who never show they're having a baby. And Pammy's arrival caught us all by surprise. The only doctor in the hotel we were staying at was a retired throat specialist, which I didn't think was good enough. So I put a call through to Madrid to ask my cousin, Queen of Spain, for her advice. But she was away. And I got through to King Alfonso, who jumped to all the wrong conclusions. He said, you're having a baby? How exciting. I'll tell nobody. I said, it wasn't that at all. It was Edwina who wanted help. Oh, he said, very well, I'll tell the military governor. When the governor of Barcelona arrived in full dress uniform, he said that by orders of the king, he was putting sentries on the hotel. All they ever succeeded in doing was trying to stop the Spanish doctor coming in when he did arrive. It was all very extraordinary, but Edwina and Pammy seemed to be none the worse for it. The twenties ran out amid new disappointments and sharpening discontents. 1929, when the Mountbattens were adding to their family in Spain, was the worst year of all. In Britain, there were nearly one and a half million unemployed in January. And that was the month of the Great Hunger March, when unemployed from all over Britain converged in ragged columns on London. Wal Hannington, a Scottish leader, wrote, We set out to blaze the trail for over 500 miles on the roads of Britain, calling upon the workers of the land to stir their slumbering selves and to rise against the callous governing class, responsible for the terrible plight of the unemployed. But unemployment was not just a British phenomenon. In Germany, there were almost two million out of work, a fertile recruiting ground for extremism. In America, there were over a million and a half, and worse was to come. October 1929 was the month of the Wall Street crash, the most seismic shock ever sustained by the capitalist system. Its effects spread rapidly through the Western world. Unemployed in Germany climbed towards six millions. In Britain, the figure reached three and a quarter millions by 1931, which meant that between six and seven million people were living on the dole, a vast and sickening human tragedy. I wasn't completely insulated from events. Edwina and our progressive friends saw to that. In any case, as the symptoms of the slump developed, mass unemployment was, of course, the worst of them, one would have needed to have been pretty thick-headed not to have realized that this was a terrible business. On the other hand, people in the services in those days were, to a large extent, insulated from civilian life. And it happens that these years, 1929 to 1931, were also years of very intense professional activity for me. For most of this time, I was the senior instructor in wireless telegraphy at the Signal School of Portsmouth, and I found plenty to occupy my time. His fame had come before him, it was true, but it was clear to us that as soon as he arrived, he was determined to improve the conditions, the methods, and everything that was employed in the instructional department. His enthusiasm was unbounded. Time was no object. 
We often uh, worked weekends in order to get things done that he wanted done. And uh, the enthusiasm which he had in the job was soon felt and exercised by the ratings themselves, who took a far greater interest in their job and found that he was always willing to help them in every way. I really enjoyed being an instructor. Teaching and lecturing presented a new challenge and I became tremendously absorbed in this. Also, I discovered that a wide area of wireless instruction was due for overhaul. And as senior instructor, I was really able to get my teeth into this. I devised a new and simplified way of laying out the electrical diagrams. And I wrote the first comprehensive textbook on all the wireless sets in use in the Navy. I worked with Mountbatten on this book, and I was not unnaturally somewhat overawed by the formidable nature of the task. I was, however, reckoning without the very practical assistance which I was to receive from Mountbatten himself. Most evenings he would send for me and go through the work in the minutest detail, often telling me that I ought to do this or I ought not to do that, and frequently quoting something which I told him several weeks previously. He combined this with his ability as an instructor, and of course that was one of his flares, a remarkable ability to present complicated matters simply for the benefit of his audience. While Mountbatten was immersed in his work, the depression continued gloomily into the 30s. Neither a second Labour government in 1929 nor Ramsay MacDonald's national government in 1931 could find more than slight palliatives of the worldwide economic illness. In 1931, the effects of the depression touched the services. The announcement of a 10% cut in service pay produced a mutiny in the Atlantic fleet at Invergordon. The news of this event appalled the nation and created a panic among foreign holders of sterling. One French banker even telephoned London to know if it was true that the British fleet was bombarding the south coast resorts. Now I'd just come back to the Mediterranean, this time as fleet wireless officer. The Invergordon mutiny shook us all. In fact, it was one of the main factors that toppled Britain off the gold standard. My own conviction is that it was largely concerned with higher purchase, which was just getting into its stride at that time. The amount of the naval pay cut was about the amount that a lot of men were paying out each week for their furniture and so forth. And naturally they were seriously alarmed in case their furniture was seized and their homes broken up. But I'm sure the mutiny was also largely due to the accidental fact of the whole of the Atlantic fleet being concentrated at Invergordon just when the announcement of the cuts came through, which meant that the men could meet each other ashore and work up each other's feelings. The men of the Mediterranean fleet were every bit as worried as the men of the Atlantic fleet. But, as it happened, the Mediterranean fleet was completely dispersed, and the men were unable to communicate with each other, except by wireless. My assistant fleet wireless officer, my staff chief petty officer telegraphist, and I kept a continuous watch on all fleet wavelengths to make sure that no illicit messages were passed from ship to ship. None were passed and there were no disturbances in the Mediterranean fleet. Being fleet wireless officer was exciting. It was a largely uncharted field of responsibility. Wireless had played a big part in the First World War. Admiralty control of the fleets had been transformed by wireless telegraphy. But my job in 1931 was to bring fleet control of every ship by wireless to the highest pitch of perfection. The wireless telegraphists were, of course, my first concern. They were the men who were working with me, whatever ship they happened to belong to. They were scattered throughout the fleet, and it was a big fleet in those days, some 70 ships. As specialists practicing what many people thought of as a black art, their position could be rather lonely. They were often only noticed when they made a mistake. They were a bit short of what we'd now call esteem. I felt that it was necessary to tighten up the organization, to make them have a sense of belonging to something, instead of being all alone in their own ships. I had to impose my personality, not an easy thing to do in a fleet of that size, and on a Morse key. 
I was leading telegraphist on the staff of Lord Mountbatten during this period in Malta, and I was able to see how he imposed his own personality on the various wireless departments of ships. When he visited the ship, he was able to refer to members of the wireless department by name. He knew ev every piece of radio equipment that they had in the ship. If there had been any irregularities or breakdown in transmission and things of that sort. The secret, of course, was that in his office, he kept a card index. And on the way out on a launch, he would get up to date with the various happenings in that particular ship. And consequently, the staff were amazed and thought that it was marvelous that he should know so much about their particular ship. My other job was to educate the senior officers of the fleet in the potential of wireless, that's radio as we now call it, and the work which their telegraphists were doing. I dealt with this by laying on some rather dramatic demonstrations. We really went to town on these, I'm a bit of a showman and I must say I thoroughly enjoy a stunt of this sort. We demonstrated the speed of communication with the Admiralty. We showed the importance of wireless discipline and that if a ship breaks silence, we could identify her by the pitch of her morse, even if she only made one dot. We simulated a battle by getting the ships themselves to make action signals. We had airplanes in the air, we had submerged submarines, and we fed all their signals in through loudspeakers as they came in. Mountbatten was making his mark. In 1931 at Portsmouth, a confidential report described him as a natural leader who exerts a strong influence and constantly inspires keenness. When he left the signal school, he was thoroughly recommended for promotion as likely to do well in the higher ranks of the service. In 1933, the Commander-in-Chief Mediterranean called him an invaluable many-sided officer. And now it was time for Mountbatten to move on. Now I was due to get what every naval officer wants most, command of a ship. But first I had to do a course at the Naval Tactical School. While I was there, something happened, which not only gave me a most striking illumination of the problems of command, but also made me very glad that I'd been a specialist in signals for the last 10 years. We were still learning the lessons of the First World War. We were still a post jutland Navy. And while I was at the tactical school, the first complete presentation of the Battle of Jutland took place, based on the fullest information, German as well as British. Admiral Jellicoe, who had commanded the Grand Fleet at Jutland, came along with his senior staff. Admiral Beatty, who had been my hero from the moment I joined his flagship six weeks after the battle, was also invited, but he didn't turn up. When the presentation was over, Jellicoe opened the discussion. He told us that this was the first time that the whole situation had ever been made clear to him, and it all looked very plain sailing now. But then he did a very remarkable thing. He picked up a blackboard duster and laid it around the models representing the four nearest German battleships. Visibility had been so bad, he told us, that at no time had he ever seen more than four out of the 22 battleships of the German high seas fleet. And the information he received was so poor that at no time had he ever had any clear idea of what the high seas fleet was doing. This was a revelation of the fog of war and the stresses of high command. Winston Churchill wrote that Jellicoe was the only man on either side who could lose the war in an afternoon. The crucial decision he had to make was how to deploy the Grand Fleet for battle. His Chief of Staff, Admiral Madden, told us that the staff were staggered at the maneuver Jellicoe adopted, which had never been tried before. They even wondered if his mind had given way under the pressure of the moment. So the morning after the battle, they analyzed his decision, and it took them three hours to reach the conclusion he had reached in 30 seconds. My admiration for him was unbounded. Mountbatten was not likely to forget the lesson of Jutland, the vital role of communications in his own command. This came to him at the age of 34, and was noted with delight by his young daughters, Patricia and Pamela, who recorded their father's promotion in their own fashion. 
and command of a ship took the family once more to Malta. It's difficult for anyone not in the Navy to understand the feelings of a ship's company for their ship. Two sister ships can be absolutely alike, but their personalities are quite different. A reflection, I suppose, of the composite personality of the ship's company, the officers, and above all, the captain. I've only once left a ship without feeling very sad at parting. The captain's feelings, of course, are absolutely special. I wrote to my mother in 1934, here I am in my first command, a bit dazed, but feeling very grand. That about sums it up. 40,000 horsepower under your hand. You can move your ship wherever you want. You must navigate her through all dangers. You must be father and mother and God Almighty to every man in her. And you get paid for doing the most wonderful job in the world. I can't imagine anybody who really knows about the Navy not wanting to be in the Navy. And I had extra luck. My first command was HMS Daring, one of our very latest and newest destroyers. We were all terribly proud of her. And ours was a crack flotilla under a fine Captain D. I put up a motto, a quotation from Hackloot, I think. We've made every sea the highway of our daring. But pride came before a fall. After a few months, we were ordered to exchange ships with a China destroyer flotilla, old ships dating back to the First World War. I had done everything I could to identify my crew with the daring. Daring by name and daring by nature, that's us, I told them, and all that sort of thing. Our new ship was called the Wishart, after a not very distinguished Admiral of Portsmouth many years ago. What could I tell them about that? I'll tell you what I said to them about Wishart. We've just left behind a name, the Daring, a wonderful name. We've come to the only ship in the Navy with a greater name. For our ship is called after the Almighty himself, to whom we pray every day, our Father Wishart in heaven. The Mountbatten treatment worked. He organized a band. He started a ship's newspaper. By every possible means, he worked up the spirit of HMS Wishart's company. He saw a great opportunity in the forthcoming flotilla regatta in 1935. He coolly announced that he wanted the Wishart to carry off all the trophies, but in particular to win the whaler races. Life now became a particular form of hell for the officers and men of the Wishart. I was the second lieutenant of the Wishart at that time. Our captain was determined that we should win the flotilla regatta, and to this end he bent all his enormous enthusiasm and energy. He installed metronomes in the stern of the boat so that we should get our strokes in time. He gave us orange juice to drink, and each time we towed up to the start of a practice, we were given two lumps of sugar each to give us energy. He installed a dry puller on board the ship so that even when we were at sea, we shouldn't escape our constant practice. When we began to get boils on our bottoms, which one always does at the beginning of these practice periods, instead of just letting them cure themselves, he issued our wives with some disgusting mud-like preparation, which he insisted that they should boil up and apply to our bottoms in the evening. It was extremely painful, but I suppose it was effective because uh, we were cured. And in the event, of course, we did win the regatta, and we won practically all the races, but without any style at all. In fact, the officer's crew, when coming down the winning stretch, were described by one onlooker as looking exactly like a drunken water beetle. Um, so although his, though, although his methods were unorthodox, the results were highly satisfactory, and we won the regatta in a most resounding style. It was fine to achieve what we'd set out to do. We collected six of the 11 available cups. One of our whalers won by no less than 15 lengths. Better still, though, was winning both the regatta and the gunnery trophy, which was almost unheard of. We won that on hits per minute. It seemed obvious to me that the best thing for guns to do is to hit their targets. And yet, I came in for a puke over there. 
and the fetish in the Navy at that time was fast shooting, and I was criticized for my slow rate of fire. When I pointed out that we would probably have sunk any one of our fast shooting rivals before they could hit us, I think this was regarded as rather bad taste. In 1935, the sound of gunfire, gunfire in earnest, heralded a new phase in international affairs. On October the 2nd, Italy invaded Abyssinia. This was the first of the major dictator's aggressions which were to form the prelude to the Second World War. As Britain declared herself against Italian policy, the new and imposing Italian fleet offered a threat to Malta and British lifelines through the Mediterranean. In the face of this Italian threat, Malta was no longer a safe base for the Mediterranean fleet. It was transferred to Alexandria. We in the W class, the first destroyer of Attila, were left in little doubt about what all this implied. When the fleet went off to Alexandria, we were left behind. We were old ships. Our job was to go on showing the flag in Malta. And if the worst came to the worst, to do all we could to head us and hold up the Italians. But when the others said their goodbyes to us, you didn't have to be a mind reader to see what they thought of our chances. We were expendable. And then something else happened which opened my eyes. I had to take the wish out to Bizerta to discuss with a French admiral there the technicalities of our receiving support from his dockyard if Malta was bombed. I knew the admiral spoke perfect English, but now he refused to talk to me except in French, and rather rude French at that. In fact, I found him completely uncooperative. I realized then how fragile the Anglo-French alliance might prove to be, and how doubly dangerous the position was. Edwina had stayed behind when the other wives left Malta, and was in fact broadcasting for the newly created Malta Radio. I told her how serious I thought things had become, and found that she'd already reached the same conclusion. It was a turning point in our lives. Both of us, Edwina and I, became crusaders, and, like all prophets of doom, rather unpopular ones. But we were sure now that the dictators meant war, and we made it our business to say so loud and clear. The Abyssinian crisis revealed the pitiful weakness of the League of Nations and the democracies. Mussolini continued his conquering march towards Addis Ababa, undeterred by sanctions or demonstrations of force. Other dictators and would-be dictators took note. On March the 7th, 1936, German troops marched into the demilitarized zone of the Rhineland. Later that month, a 99% vote in favor of official Nazi candidates in the German elections showed the new temper of the German people. In Britain, the defense budget increased by what seemed at the time a large figure, 36 million pounds. Part of this sum was earmarked for the increase and modernization of the fleet air arm. In July 1936, Mount Patton was summoned home to a new appointment in the Naval Air Division, which bore responsibility for the fleet air arm. This meant for him a farewell to the Mediterranean, which had been the center of his professional life for so many years, and which had now become the center of storms which would shake the world. Things were obviously hotting up. One didn't feel one was in a peacetime navy anymore, but in an eve of war navy. And there was a lot to be done to prepare ourselves for war. My years in the Mediterranean had taught me a great deal. Now I was given the chance of putting it to further use in a wider and very exciting field, if time permitted. <laughs> 